When it comes to aviation accidents and discussing them in a format as is done on this channel, what makes the case of Air New Guinea Flight 73 stand out among others is the sheer amount of video footage available. The accident went viral in 2018 as video surfaced of the plane submerged in water, including footage inside of the plane. There even exists video from inside the cockpit in the plane's final seconds. Despite the plane being relatively intact in this now viral footage, it was a fatal accident. And what we're here to discuss today is not the spectacle of the submerged plane, but rather how it got there in the first place. In this video, we'll examine the approach process of the flight from its initial descent to its final moments before plunging into the water. Air New Guinea is the national flag carrier airline of the nation of Papua New Guinea. Operating out of the PNG capital of Port Moresby, the airline has a network of routes which connect to the island nations of Oceania. On Friday, September 28, 2018, Air New Guinea operated one of their few Boeing 737s on a route between Port Moresby and Ponape in Micronesia. In the return back to Port Moresby, Flight 73 was to make a stopover in Chuk also in Micronesia. The 737 plane involved was a 2005 built Boeing 737-800. The 800 model was part of what Boeing called the next generation of the plane, featuring a highly computerized flight deck full of digital displays that was meant to replace the aging Boeing 737s yet to be retired. The 737-800 was and still is one of the most popular planes in the world in the modern day. Registered as Papa 2 Papa X-Ray Echo, this 737 started its life flying for Air India, where it was involved in a minor runway incursion. Its history can be tracked being sold from one airline to another over the years. In 2010, it was sold to another Indian airline, Jet Airways, before they sold it to a leasing company, who then let it out to Air New Guinea, who began operating it in 2013. The plane, just a few months prior to the accident of discussion today, was involved in another incident at Port Moresby when a Lockheed Hercules cargo plane damaged its winglet. After repair, it was put back into service once again. By the time of the accident, it had made over 14,000 flights. The plane landed in Ponape at around 10 p.m. the previous evening. The crew stayed there overnight, having signed off duty at 11 p.m. They would turn up for work the following morning at 7.50 a.m. to take it back to Papua New Guinea. The captain, a 52-year-old male Papua New Guinean, had accumulated nearly 20,000 fly hours, making him a highly experienced captain. He was the one actually flying the plane. The first officer was an Australian male. At 35 years old, they were much less experienced, with just over 4,500 hours logged and still new to the plane with under 400 hours on the 737. Also on board was an engineer from the aircraft's leasing company, which itself was based out of Iceland. With a total of 12 crew members, there were just 47 people on board. 35 passengers would board the plane for this leg of the trip. These flights were performed as a public service, and weren't necessarily there to generate a profit for the airline. Flight 73 left Ponape at 9.22 a.m. for the first leg of the trip to Chuk, climbing up to an altitude of 40,000 feet. The majority of the flight was uneventful. The airport in Chuk is only small and serves as the hub for travelers traveling in and out of the cluster of islands here in the Pacific Ocean. There is just one runway which is built on reclaimed land that stretches out into the water. Runway 04 was in use, meaning Flight 73 needed to make an approach from the southwest. Navigating by air for commercial pilots in the modern age often means programming a series of waypoints along airways to reach the intended destination. The same technology can be used for programming approach flight paths. There was a discussion on the flight deck before descent where the pilots discussed their landing configuration such as flaps and landing speeds. They agreed on a flap setting of 40 degrees. This was then followed up with a discussion about the approach and missed approach procedures. Investigators would find that these conversations were not in line with the airline's standard operating procedures. 
For example, the pilots did not use the correct phraseology when conversing, and the missed approach was barely mentioned. Though several thousand miles from the United States, Flight 73 was actually in contact with air traffic controllers in San Francisco and had given the pilots clearance to descend down to a lower altitude of 34,000 feet, beginning the descent and approach phase of the flight. It was at the top of descent that the pilot flying noticed that they were rather high and began descending immediately. Once reaching 34,000 feet, the captain again noticed the plane was too high. A vertical profile was programmed into the flight computer, meaning the plane knows roughly what altitude it should be at by each waypoint. Flight 73 was not on this descent profile, and so the captain began descending further before the crew made contact with air traffic control in Chuck, though the first officer would notify the controllers in San Francisco that they passed 18,000 feet. A weather update was issued from local ATC, describing local meteorological conditions as cloudy, overcast, but with substantial visibility of 14 kilometers. The approach continued, and the first officer notified the ground of their position 15 nautical miles southeast of the airport at 8,600 feet. Another attempt to discuss the missed approach was initiated by the captain, but he failed to continue it. The first officer also seemingly did not respond to this. The pilots raided out their intention to perform what is called an RNAV approach to the runway. RNAV is a type of navigation on aircraft which has been around for about 50 years. It allows pilots to fly more simplified flight paths. A lot of times, pilots need to navigate airways and intersect numerous fixed waypoints. With an RNAV approach, fixtures and waypoints can be simple geographic coordinates, bypassing the need for complex air corridors of waypoints. For an airport such as Chuk, RNAV is the easiest and simplest way for a Boeing 737 to approach the runway. The time was now 9.21 a.m. local time, having crossed into a different time zone. The pilots had descended down to 4,000 feet and had begun configuring their plane for landing. A flap setting of 15 degrees was initially called out. The CVR transcript, as detailed in the accident report, suggests that communication between the pilots was an ongoing issue during the flight. For example, at 9.21 and 27 seconds, the captain began a sentence about configuration but did not finish, and so any instructions to the first officer were lost. The first officer also made an observation about a potential storm in the area. Regardless, the pilots observed the airport and lined up for landing, with the help of the autopilot in Arna fixtures. The landing checklist was then initiated. The landing would appear normal as Flight 73 descended below 2,000 feet. However, visibility had decreased as the plane had entered deteriorating weather conditions near and over the airport. The autopilot would remain connected to the plane's flight controls for much of the landing sequence descending below 1,000 feet. At roughly 625 feet, the captain disengaged the autopilot to take over manual control. He however could not see the airport. In fact, given the fact that the airport is located on a small island, he also had no ground reference at all, just ocean. Moments later, as Flight 73 passed through 500 feet, according to the accident report, the approach became unstabilized. In this context, this meant that the plane began to drop below the glide slope. The captain who would survive the accident was later interviewed by investigators, where he said he found the plane to be less stable with a flap configuration of 40 degrees and found it handled better with just 30 degrees of flap. By the time that this happened, flaps had already been extended to 40 degrees. The minimum's altitude advisory sounded this meant that the plane had descended to an altitude where pilots should not normally descend further without A being stabilized on the approach and B having a visual reference with either the airport or ground. Though pilots can descend down to this altitude before they really need to, they should maintain that altitude until these criteria are met. Once passing this altitude though, neither pilot would arrest the descent and so the plane dropped further, just a few hundred feet above the water. In Flight 73's final seconds, the vertical speed would indicate a rate of descent of around negative 1500 feet per minute, a much faster descent than normal at this phase of flight. The ground proximity warning system began issuing glide slope and sink rate warnings. The pilots seemingly did not respond appropriately to these oral alerts. According to the accident report, there is no evidence to indicate that the sink rate was being arrested. 
the pilots disregarded the alerts the plane was giving them. At an altitude of just 30 feet above the water, the first officer's tone would quickly shift as he exclaimed that they were dangerously low. This was just two seconds before the plane would hit the water with a high vertical speed of negative 1200 feet per minute. Air New Guinea Flight 73 impacted the water about 1500 feet short of runway 04, coming down in the lagoon nearby to the airport. Though the plane crashed into the water, the aircraft was relatively intact, the fuselage not broken upon impact. Had that have happened, then the outcome of this accident could have been much worse. Of the 47 occupants on board the 737, 46 survived, some with serious injury. One passenger was tragically killed in the accident. The Indonesian national was seated in the window seat on the left side in row 23, towards the rear of the cabin. The six further passengers who suffered some serious injuries were also seated towards the back of the cabin. The deceased passenger was found by divers laying on his back on the floor between seating in rows 22 and 23. Upon further examination, an autopsy revealed that he died within minutes of the accident occurring. As it turned out, they were not wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash. Their body became a projectile in that moment, causing head trauma. First responders quickly arrived on boats. Divers, members of the United States Navy, and locals who happened to be out on their boats assisted with the evacuation of passengers. There certainly were some questionable actions by some of these individuals, because it was revealed that some had allowed passengers to re-enter the plane after leaving to retrieve their belongings. Video of this evacuation is easily found on the internet. Speaking of video, as it turned out, the engineer from the plane's Icelandic leasing company happened to be videoing the landing from the jump seat, which ended the moment the plane hit the water. They were taking this video supposedly for recreational purposes. The crash of Air New Guinea Flight 73 was put down to a loss of situational awareness from the pilots. The final report also lists many factors which contributed to a poor evacuation of the plane. Confusion arose in the cabin once the plane was in the water. The cabin crew seemingly did not know what to do next. The term evacuate itself was not understood by some passengers. Other passengers were also caught attempting to take their hand luggage against the instructions from the cabin crew, although one member of cabin crew was also caught retrieving their belongings. Considerable praise was given to some members of the cabin crew, as according to one source, they were noted pulling passengers out of the water which had entered and filled part of the cabin. Going forward, Air New Guinea took on the recommendations made by the investigation, which included amendments to passenger evacuation and pilot competency. Further recommendations were made to Honeywell, the company who made the plane's instruments, to amend oral warnings in the cockpit. Hello everyone, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you are having a great day. Also, Happy New Year, as it will be New Year's Day when this goes out. Hope you had a great New Year's celebration. Anyway, I will swiftly move on to thanking my patrons, as I shan't make this long. If you want to support the channel further, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and get early access to all new videos, as well as getting your name featured here at the end of the next video. Anyway, a thank you to the £5 tier patrons, Adventures of Stupid, Alice Lutris, Avery Tioda, Barlavon, Chilhelm, Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmatellas, Jennifer Fraketic, Joey, John Ambrosia, KTP123, Kali Randoja, I hope I said that right, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Len, Leon San Jennings, Murray Ennis, MG, Michelle, Mom Left Me a Best Buy, MX Koifish, Pac Man 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Pipsqueak, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Wheatley, Saria Melody, Sleepy, Tristar Triforce, Tristan Kriegsman, and Vapor Yashi. And thanks to the £10 tier patrons for the generous support Ada Montgomery, Anne Sid, Bard Ghost Isu, Derek Bean, Epsilon, Erin Wilson, Karma, Lily K. May, Maga Seal, Megan Garrick, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, So FP, Steve Cottrell, Thick Coconut, Trans Rights Baby, a name I highly approve of, Vapronva, and Where Are My Cheetos?
Thank you all so much. And that is it from me. Happy New Year, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.